Will you come and follow me if I but call your name? Will you go where you don't know and never be the same? Will you let my love be shown? Will you let my name be known? Will you let my life be grown in you and you in me? Hi, I'm Ron Watson, pastor of First Presbyterian Church here in Ocala, Florida. I'm glad you could worship with us today. It's a great day in the life of the church. We are getting ready for Vacation Bible School in a few weeks. But we're also getting to that quiet part of the summer where people go off and travel different places. So we do pray that wherever you are, you're being safe. If you're in Florida, we do pray also that you'll pay attention to hurricane preparedness and take all of that seriously as the hurricane season is now in full swing. I'm glad you're here. Welcome to church.
Good morning. We are called to worship with a psalm. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars and all that you have established, I am amazed and humbled. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Let us worship God. Will you join me for a prayer of confession of sin? Please say it with me. God of justice and love, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy upon us as we confess our sin. We call you God of creation, yet we serve idols of our own making. We confess Christ as Savior, yet we rely on elaborate security systems for our protection. We claim the indwelling of spirit, yet we abide by our own counsel. Forgive our double-mindedness, and through Christ, make us whole. I invite you to silent prayer. Amen. Know that in the name of Jesus, we are forgiven. 
Amen. Our first reading is from Genesis 18. It's 1 through 15, a long and familiar story. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat in the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing there near him. When he saw them, he ran from his tent uh, to meet them. He bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, please do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves. And after that, you may pass on since you've come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, make, make ready three measures of choice flour, knead it and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. He said to them, they said to him, where's your servant? Where's your wife, Sarah? And he said, there, in in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife, Sarah, shall have a son. Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind them. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old advanced in age. It had ceased to be with her after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I've grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I'm old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord. At the set time I will return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But but, but Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh. She was afraid. He said, Oh, yes, you did laugh. What a wonderful story. May God add his blessing to the reading and the hearing and the understanding of his holy word. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God, yeah. When I was your foe, Still your love fought for me You have been so, so good to me When I felt no worth You paid it all for me Jesus, you have been so, so kind Oh, 
God Always chases me down Fights till I'm found Leaves the 99 I couldn't earn it I don't deserve it Still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming Never-ending Reckless love of God Yeah There's no shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me There's no wall Chases me down Fights till I'm found Leaves the 99 I couldn't earn it I don't deserve it Still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming Never-ending Reckless love of God Yeah Good morning. Recently, I was driving down the road and I saw a huge field of wildflowers. Have you ever seen a field of wildflowers? Aren't they beautiful? You know, the funny thing about wildflowers is that they're actually weeds. Now, we don't like weeds when they grow in our yard or in our gardens, do we? But when we see them all blooming, like in a field of wildflowers, they're really gorgeous. It's all about how you look at it, right? You know, we're kind of like these weeds too. Sometimes we don't mind our parents. We don't go to bed when we're supposed to. We talk back. We do things we're not supposed to do. We say things we're not supposed to say. We sin. Does God stop loving us? No. He looks at us and he doesn't see weeds. He sees beautiful wildflowers. The Bible says in today's reading, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God loves us just the way we are. Now that doesn't mean he wants us to talk back or to do bad things, but it means he'll always love us and that Christ died for us. And if we believe in him, we'll live with him in heaven forever. Sometimes, we look at others and we see weeds. They're not doing what they should or acting like they should. They don't treat us like they, we think they should. Let's try to look at them as God looks at them and love them as he does and tell them about Jesus. Let's all strive to see beautiful wildflowers all around us and not weeds. Let's pray. Dear Lord, Thank you for the wildflowers. Help them to remind us to see others as wildflowers and not weeds. In your name we pray. Amen. Just one quick announcement. If you are interested in signing up to volunteer for Vacation Bible School, or you would like to sign your children or grandchildren up for Vacation Bible School, you can do so at fpcocala.org. Thank you.
it's prayer time, and I don't have any new announcements or urgent prayers. We continue to pray for the staff that's assembling VBS and for many others, and we'll cover that in this prayer on this Trinity Sunday. Let's pray. O blessed Trinity, in whom we know the maker of all things, seen and unseen, Savior of both far and near, by your Spirit enable us to worship you in divine majesty, so that with all the company of heaven we may magnify your glorious name, saying, Holy, 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 glory to you, God Most High. We praise you and thank you. We ask for you to be with us, our church, our community, our nation. Lord, hear our prayers. Satisfy us with your love in the morning. We will live this day in joy and praise. Great and wonderful God, we praise and thank you for the gift and renewal of Jesus Christ, for the presence of the Holy Spirit, for your love, O God, our Father. Especially, we thank you for ministries of music and the arts, both in the church and in culture. We thank you for those who enlighten and entertain. We thank you for the love of family and friends. As summer deepens, we thank you for a time of rest and recreation. We pray for teachers who are resting and those who are teaching summer school, for administrators who work the year long, for others, Lord, who are traveling, for folks who come to Florida for vacation, keep them safe as they zoom up and down I-75, as they stop in our community and are a part of our economy. We're grateful for them and for our um, tourist business. We pray for all in our church and outside our church who work in that important industry for our state. We are also grateful, Lord, for promises kept, for hope for tomorrow, for all of our church members, those who are enjoying a summer off from their studies, those who are enjoying retirement, those who work so very hard, Lord, to hear our prayers for everyone as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for your support of First Presbyterian Church here in Ocala, Florida. We do appreciate your giving, and without it, we cannot have church. You may give to us online on our website and by clicking on Give. Or you can give in a more traditional way. Go to the website and find our address there, and you may mail us a check. Let us pray. Father, Son, and Spirit, on this Trinity Sunday, we thank you for all of the ways we are blessed in creation, in redemption, and being sustained as your people. Take our gifts and use them for your glory, three in one, world without end. Amen. Our second lesson is from Paul's letter to the Romans in chapter five, beginning with verse one. Hear the word of the Lord. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, 
at the right time. Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. for the best. 
Hope is a word that we do not need to look up in any dictionary because each of us has already defined the word through our unique existence and experience. It is a word that is very much a part of our human nature, or one could even say of all of God's creatures. Hope is a prediction of what may come our way. Many famous people have been quoted on the subject, and I've brought a few with me today to share with you. Mother Teresa says this about hope. She said, to keep a lamp burning, we have to keep putting oil in it. Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson says, we judge a person's wisdom by their hope. And Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, put it this way, we must accept finite disappointment, but we must never lose infinite hope. And finally, Pearl Buck, we must have hope or starve to death. So hope has different levels. Uh, there are trivial levels of hope too. You might say, I, I hope we're not having chicken tonight for dinner. Or um, you, you might have already say, I, I hope watching this broadcast that there are going to be some songs to sing that I know. But we have more serious levels about hope that is much more life-shaping, but also not totally critical, like I hope I get into a certain school, I hope the gas, price of gas comes down, or at least it stops going up. But when we start talking about the most serious matter of all, which is salvation, hope means something different altogether. The word hope is more an expression of our trust in God, our faith, that Jesus really saves, that eternal life is ours. That kind of hope is not a wondering hope, but a trusting expression that God will deliver each of us from death into life eternal. But somewhere in the middle of all of these kinds of hope is the hope that tears up each of us inside, the hope that is really not hopeful at all. It is somewhere between worry and despair, between fear and dread, a rest in life's concerto that makes us wonder if everything will turn out okay or not. You probably know this hope well. It is a hope that bear, can barely be grasped when life is on the line when a relative has a serious illness, when a loved one is in surgery, when you're to hear from a doctor in the emergency room. And this kind of hope is not only there, it is the hope that gets away from us when our checking accounts are lean, when our relationships are rocky, when our lives are really not turning out according to the script that we wrote for ourselves years ago. That is the hope that all of us are looking for, the hope that binds us over to God, that releases us from doubt and worry. When Paul said, hope does not disappoint us, he was giving us words of encouragement, not stating merely a fact about hope. Although it could be true that when we have hope, along with faith and love, certainly, we really have need of nothing else. But Paul knew about the hope we are all looking to have. And he told us that the present sufferings that we have produce character and character produces hope. So let's talk about why we should have hope and what we should hope for and, and why hope does not disappoint us. We have hope because God is in charge of this life as well as the next one. That's certainly an easy thing for us to forget. So many times this life seems to be a chaotic hodgepodge of episodes as we bounce from traffic to worrying over children and grandchildren to bills to fixing our cars to pandemic to why in the world does the grocery store out of milk? It seems like so much of this life is too trivial for God. And we often wonder if all of life isn't trivial to God. 
That might be so if God did not know all of us personally. That might be so if God had not had each of us in mind when he sent his son, Jesus, to die for us on the cross. But that is why we have hope. That and nothing more. Simply that God is love and loved us so much that he saved us. Yet we all still live with original sin, a life that is not perfect, a life full of enough suffering, of enough turmoil, of enough worry that we forget that we have hope at all. But we could learn from the birds. Here's a story I know uh, from a woman whose name I only know is Laura, and she wrote this. It isn't often that I'm awake early enough to hear the birds start singing. She says, I woke up Saturday morning, long before I planned to, for some odd reason. Sometimes my body just does that and I don't know why. All I know is that it has nothing to do with caffeine. <laughs> she continues, sometimes I wonder why the birds sing. I've heard that it's because they're happy to see the sun again. Funny thing is, I was able to witness that the singing starts long before the sun is even visible. And yet they sing anyway. They sing in the darkness because they know it won't stay dark forever. How do they know this? The same way we do. And she quotes Isaiah 35 verse four, say to those with fearful hearts, be strong. Do not fear, your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. It would be so easy to sing in the darkness as an act of pity, to mourn for the pain it is causing us, but the birds aren't doing that, and neither should we. Sing to welcome the sun even if you can't quite see it yet. That's hope. I really like that. So then what should we hope for? If hope doesn't disappoint us, and we could try to believe Paul on that, and, and God gives us hope, what would be a reasonable hope for us to have? Well, we should hope for what we've been promised in Christ Jesus. So many times we forget all that Christ promised us thinking that the, the promise of the Son of God is eternal life in heaven and something like eternal misery until we get there. But Jesus said nothing of the sort, did he? One of my many favorite passages of scripture is the one we use during communion uh, where we hear the words of Jesus, take my yoke on you and, and learn of me. Let's do that together. For I'm meek and lowly in heart and you will find rest unto your souls. We have to do more than believe in Jesus Christ if we are to have hopes. We must believe that his promises are true. Only then can we begin to know what to hope for. We can hope for peace of mind. We can hope for knowing that God will set things right in God's own time. We can read the Psalms and know that among other things, our enemies will be accountable to God just as we are. We can hope for the forgiveness of God, even for the worst of our sins, because that too is promised. We are so fortunate to hope for all these things because God has given us reason to hope. It's amazing what you can hope for when your reasons for hoping are genuine. Some years ago, a man named Eugene Land greatly changed the lives of a sixth grade class in East Harlem. Mr. Lang had been asked to speak to a class of 59 sixth graders. What could he say to inspire these students, most of whom would drop out of school? He wondered how he could get these children even to look at him. Scrapping his notes, he decided to speak to them from his heart Stay in school, he admonished, and I'll help pay the college tuition for every one of you. At that moment, the lives of these 59 students changed. For the first time, they had hope. Said one student, 
I had something to look forward to, something waiting for me. It was a golden feeling. Nearly 90% of that class went on to graduate from high school. And being a Christian with the promises of Jesus at hand is no different. We can hope to be happy. We can hope to find peace in our lives. We can hope to eat another meal after the next one and all because the Lord promises these things to us. How sad for us when we forget God's promises. And if we have hope in Jesus Christ and we know what things are reasonable for us to hope for in him, why is it that hope does not disappoint us? That's a hard phrase for us to deal with as Christians because we've all had disappointments. We've had disappointments in love, disappointments in business, disappointments with our friends or disappointed in lacking friendship. Let's remember for a minute exactly who Paul was talking to, but besides all of us, he was talking to a group of people who were suffering precisely because they were Christians. They were being persecuted, some even tortured and killed for their beliefs. And Paul had the nerve to say that hope does not disappoint us. But Paul was right because Jesus promises us that things will get better. We don't know exactly when things are going to get better, but we know for sure that they will. And getting back to the definition of what hope is, we know that in Jesus Christ, that when things look bad, the future will bring better things, that we have a future to look forward to. Because God gives us faith in our future. We have power in our present. Paul said that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character. Maybe we think we've had our fill of these things sometimes. Maybe we don't want to learn yet and one more valuable lesson through the pain of a bad experience. But because God loves us, unworthy sinners that we are, we have hope. Because that love never fails. Indeed, when all else fails, hope prevails. Because as Paul puts it, God proves his love for us and that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. So keep on hoping. That doesn't mean things won't go badly some of the time. They will. But nothing can take the true promises of God away from the people of faith. Satan can't do it. That man that yelled at you in the parking lot can't do it. Your boss can't do it. No one can take God's promises away. Thankfully, not even God can take them away. We have hope because God put hope in each one of us. And God has God's own hope for each of us. And as we hope, we talk to God and share those hopes, asking God to remove the fears. Let's hope for mended relationships for better times, for laughter, for love, because God says that's okay. God wanted us to be a people of hope, and that is why God sent us his son. So we could die to sin and have everything to live for, everything to hope for. Join me today in asking our loving God to renew our hope that our life can be good or even better than it is right now, to help us find the peace of Christ, that peace that passes all understanding, to help us through times of disappointment, of loss, of grief, to show us the way back to hope. Amen. Please join me in affirming our faith. 
In life and in death, we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, both now and forever. Amen. Go in peace.